Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I warn you that I have no PowerPoint. I will not walk. I'm wearing a suit. So I'm a non-conformist. Uh, you, you have to do it with my very well-known natural charisma. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is really paradoxical that we are commemorating this year the 500th anniversary of the publication of the famous book of Thomas More in Leuven, and that right now the Western world is in disarray and even in despair. Instead of utopia, some speak of dysopia, just the contrary. And each of us needs, needs a dream, a dream as, as a goal and meaning to his or her life. It hasn't got to be a utopia, which is considered as an impossible dream. But the absence of a dream is dramatic, also for a society as a whole. And progress is always driven by something that transcends everyday life. And even if utopia has a negative connotation, an impossible dream, sometimes the dream nurtured by generations comes true. And I'm referring, of course, to the European Union. Philosophers and authors have written hundreds of years ago about a European unification, mostly related to peace and tolerance. We had to wait until 70 years ago before we realized that dream. The EU was considered as a utopia, but as I previously said, it is no longer one. We are living since 1950 in a peaceful, prosperous, and democratic society in Europe. The ideologies of the past have all died, especially fascism and communism. The Union now embraces 500 million people instead of 150 million at the beginning of the project. Unfortunately, we are losing the UK, but in the upcoming decades, other countries will join the club. It seems a little bit odd today to say the following. The EU was a success story, and to some extent, it still is. Let us not forget this statement, even in turbulent times. The importance of a person, the importance of an initiative, as the EU, is always better understood once he or she isn't there anymore. And that's why we underestimate the cost of non-Europe. And young people can't imagine a Europe with border controls, with more than 20 currencies, with old-fashioned nationalist rhetoric about France first, Germany first, or Denmark first, whilst China, India, and the others are conquering the world economically and even politically. We now represent in Europe 7% of the world population and 20% of GDP. Though since these numbers are decreasing day by day, it would become a very small world within the national borders of Belgium, Flanders, or Italy. We would be the leftovers of globalization. And the youngsters of the United Kingdom understood this pretty well when they voted overwhelmingly in favor of remaining in the European Union. And many were devastated in the morning of June 24. And by the way, by the way, in four years' time, and if the plus 16 years could have voted, of could vote, the majority of 52-48 would be reversed into 48-52. It's a demographic problem. And the generation furthest away from World War II is more supportive of the European Union, the peace project in essence, than their predecessors who were born just after the war. Older people, I'm not old, 
Older people are more anxious and risk averse. They are afraid of a world with too many changes and of a space, I come back to this word later on, and of a space that creates too much uncertainty. The open market brought prosperity, but after decades, it became obvious that this prosperity didn't reach everyone, nor did everyone equally benefit from it. And as a consequence, a longing was born, not for a space, but for a place, a place that protects against dreadful development, such as unemployment, financial instability, irregular migration, terrorism, all kinds of dumping, climate change and unfair competition, and excessive inequalities. In fact, many of our co-citizens want a specific kind of change. No change at all, or no change anymore. The nostalgia of the good old days with more harmony and more fairness. And we need, I'm convinced of it, we need a new social model. We need a new synthesis. We have to protect whilst keeping our economies and our societies open. As simple as it sounds, that is the challenge for our member states, for the EU, as the EU, for the United States, and for the Western world as a whole. The danger is that fear, fear, can undermine the basic values of our societies. Putting stability above democracy, big danger. Restricting migration above prosperity, the case for Brexit. Egoism, racism and tribalism above solidarity, humanism and compassion. We have to listen to the new worries and needs of our societies, but we also have to promote the values of an open society. Otherwise, utopia means the good place in Greek. Utopia will turn into dystopia, just the opposite. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we are living in difficult and dangerous times. Democracies are not self-evident anymore. They have to deliver on new demands in our societies. And if not, we are opening a boulevard to adventurers, liars, and even political criminals. I have nobody in mind. <laughs> Values have a value in themselves, not because they have a stronger or weaker base in society. They are a value in itself. Values don't depend on the majority in a society. Otherwise, we commit what is called, as in a famous book, published before the war, that we commit la trahison des clairs, a betrayal of educated people who adapt their beliefs to mainstream thinking. This would be a nightmare instead of a dream, instead of a utopia. We need creativity, innovation, entrepreneurship in our economies and societies. L'imagination au pouvoir. Yes, imagination is powerful. But we have to make room for creativity. We have to stimulate and reward it morally and also financially. The scientist in his lab and the freaks in their garage. The third industrial revolution is taking place under our watch. Our way of life is changing in our lifetime. Expect the unexpected. But I'm struck by today's combination of technological optimism, and deep and growing social malaise. We've never had it so good, and we've never been so unhappy. The digital revolution is bright, but there is a political revolution of discontent going on. And the reason is that we are not used to disruption. We lived through so many crises on short notice. Evolution belongs more to human nature than revolution. We need time to adapt, to digest, and above all, many people fear that the digital revolution will create less jobs, unsecured jobs, or no jobs 
at all for them. If this is the case, how do we provide jobs for younger and older people? We have to empower people with more skills and prepare them for new jobs in the market or in the subsidized sector. The question is who will pay for it, the consumers or those with more wealth? Of course, the demographic implosion will spontaneously solve, to some extent, the employment problem. In some countries, even too much, because immigration will continue to be unavoidable and even necessary. We have to remain hopeful people who believe in progress, economically and socially. And hopeful people look at their fellow citizens and their fellow men not as enemies, not as rivals, not as untermenschen. Fear creates failed societies. And society becomes, in that case, a zero-sum game, a deadly concept. This could also happen in the European Union, in stagnating economies and stagnating societies, tribalism and nationalism can gain ground. And how to agree in the European Council of Leaders if there is not a minimum of political will to transcend the national differences or the opposing interests? Stronger together, a slogan, stronger together is the opposite of each for oneself. Elk voor zich. We have to turn fear into hope due to more protection and more creativity and more innovation. Hope is more stimulating to the values of togetherness and solidarity. Yes, I dare dream as our ancestors dreamt of a society of European nations. It was their utopia. But why is the European project now controversial? First of all, the time of being in love with the EU is over after a marriage of 70 years. I'm only at the stage of 35. We have now a mature relationship with the European Union, with these ups and downs. Second reason, the Union entered into our daily lives via the crisis of the Eurozone, affecting directly savings and incomes. Europe is not far away anymore. Not a dream of the elites, but a matter of us all. The euro made the EU extremely concrete, negatively concrete, but concrete, in the south, in the north, as well as in the south. We had to become more responsible and more solidary. It takes efforts, and efforts are never popular. The third reason, Europe is part of globalization which is pros and cons, with winners and losers. The winners are silent, while the losers are angry and grow in number. The European Union is not about a win-win situation anymore, as it was the case in the beginning, by opening the markets and creating a single market. The fourth reason, all transcendent ideas and authorities are views viewed with distrust and suspicion. Rising individualism contributed to that climate. Still, the EU institutions are more trustworthy than national democracies, according to the so-called Eurobarometer. The fifth reason. All national democracies and are challenged because they are, they are authorities and because they are prisoners of over-promising and under-delivering. National governments and parliaments still pretend to shape societies and policies, but in global and European context, they no longer have the instruments to fulfill all the promises. And the credibility gap was the unav unavoidable outcome. The sixth reason, Brussels blaming, Brussels bashing, became a usual practice coming from political leaders all over Europe. Although most decisions are taken unanimously, Brussels is us, 
would be a, a more correct term. The seventh reason, the EU institutions are seen as meddling and too much focused on their own bureaucratic agenda. And on top of this, the image of the EU deteriorated during and after the crisis of the euro area. The Commission became the fiscal guardian, gendarme, imposing tough and unpopular measures via the Troika, but also elsewhere. And this role was created by the member states together, but the EU institutions, they paid the price. And the European Parliament, although directly elected, is not perceived as to be close to the people. The members of Parliament, being in each country not very numerous, are not known well, well enough. And the vocation of the European Parliament to more Europe is often going against the tide, against the zeitgeist, the spirit of the time. And I have to stress again that the prestige of national governments and parliaments is even lower. Eighth reason. Effectively, more Europe, more integration, is needed in order to meet the expectations in terms of economic growth, employment, irregular migration, dumping, climate change, tax fraud, etc. The union is held responsible whilst they are lacking the necessary instruments to meet the expectations. And this delivery gap is due to an instrumental gap. The ninth reason, the EU is the sum of the member states. If things are going wrong in the member states, the EU is stalled. The political fragmentation inside the member states, the rise of populism and even extremism, is impeding the action of the European Union. If national leaders are too timid to strengthen the Union, fearing reactions in their own country, the EU is, suffers. If leaders prefer short-term national solutions in their homeland, European solutions are prevented. And most of our problems require supranational solutions. Nationalism is simply passing the hot potato to other nations. It is the big evil of the, of the 30s. Tenth and last reason. The American presidential elections showed that the US is struggling with the same issues as the Europeans. Migration, inequalities even bigger than in the 27 European member states. Terrorism, free trade, dislike of the elites, etc. The societies in the Western world as a whole are changing. In democracies, problems became rapidly public. In dictatorships, they need a revolution, such as the implosion of the Soviet Union or the Arab Spring. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I mention these arguments to counter the Euro pessimism, the self-flagellation of so many. But at the same time, I repeat that we need a new social model, a new synthesis between openness and protection, transcending the dilemma between the web people, the open people, and the world people, those who are living in a closed world. And this will allow us to avoid further confrontation, further aggressiveness, brutality, and in the end also violence. Much, much is at stake. I am still hopeful that we can overcome again these dilemmas and we can turn fear into hope. We did it in the past, we can do it in the morrow. Tomorrow, I remain a man of hope. Thank you so much.